Roosevelt's response is a classic example of sort of how inherently in his character, he's a man who is going to overcome. He wakes up every day and literally says, I'm going to walk. Um, he doesn't. He never does again. Uh, he has a system of braces. Again, if you are disabled in the 1920s, you are considered to be homebound and, and, and in some way, shape, or form, less of a capable person. Um, and as a result, as a politician, you're dead in the water if you are seen as disabled. He has a series of braces, metal braces, steel braces, kind of affixed to his legs. And you'll see an example of this in a short while. Once his two eldest sons are grown, they stand usually on either side of him. And he learns, he locks these braces, he learns to effectively walk simply by using his upper body. Right? So if you're a gym guy, you know, leg day, you're not going to see Franklin there. But upper body, um, this guy is built like a linebacker. Um, he goes to the South for the first time. He goes to Georgia, travels to Georgia to rehabilitate. A lot of these images here that you're seeing. And he brings his mistress with him to, to enjoy the thing, right? You know, and again, breaking his wife's heart, whatever. But it's really the first time uh, Roosevelt is actually able to see what conditions in the South actually look like. Right? Now remember, this is 60 years of reconstruction, and I talked about the images that you see from this period. What he sees is a third world country. Right? And Roosevelt is a Democrat. The solid base of the Democratic Party is in the South. And Roosevelt's administration effectively is going to say, I'm not going to allow a third of the United States to live like it's a third world country. So Roosevelt not only has, through his affliction, not only has a sense of suffering and overcoming hardship and maintaining optimism, but also this notion of saying, of seeing the South for the first time. So the people in the South do not have a chance. Something needs to be done, and we're going to talk about that. I don't have my big book drop on the table. But there is one example of socialism, and that is the TBA. That's federal money saying, we're going to bring electricity to these people. We're going to make it possible for them to enter the modern era. You think of radios, right, and automobiles and whatnot. So these are important kind of qualities to understand. And as we go through the 20th century, some of these uh, characteristics are going to be important to kind of understand the policies that are going to apply. He has two significant assets that I would say are critical to American politics, at least at that point in time, that may have changed. Right? Number one is he's non-ideological. As I mentioned, he's a smart guy, but he is not someone who is, oh, well, let's talk theory. Um, when the British economist John Maynard Keynes comes and talks to him about, about the nature of, uh, of uh, Keynesian economics, supply side economics, Roosevelt is not like taking notes and, oh, well, this, that, and the other studies. Yeah, yeah, I get it, sure, fine. He gets the positive aspects of it. And early on in his administration, he's asked, well, Mr. President, what's your philosophy? I love this quote. And he probably had a cigar holder in his book. Like, philosophy, philosophy. I'm a Christian and a Democrat, right? That's it. He's not someone who's driven by some ideological purpose. Again, here we live in 2022, where everything is ideology. Every political commercial, oh, they're teaching this and all that. People don't live that way. And Roosevelt didn't act that way. And very much like we saw with Teddy Roosevelt, another national progressive, Franklin Roosevelt is saying, try something. Everyone's heard of that phrase, lead, follower, get out of the way, right? You are a leader, you are an elected official. If you believe something, try it. And the American public will give you credit for at least trying something. If it doesn't work, admit it and move on. Again, we live in a contemporary political environment where it's loser, Right? You lost. That's wrong. No one exists in that world. Everyone fails. The only time you learn how to improve is when you fail. Roosevelt sees that as an inherent part of the American character. Right? We have a history of failure. But failure followed by what? Trying again and doing a better job next time. Right? And Roosevelt is driven by that sense. Most of what we're going to talk about in regards to the New Deal is going to be found unconstitutional in its first iteration. It's just going to come back. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try it this way. Right. So this, the quality of who he is is important, but what he produces, in essence, with the election is a moment where he wants to be clear to the American public that this is a transition that's taking place. Right? That this was an old age here as a new age. Uh, the two are driving in their inauguration. You can obviously see every time you see Roosevelt, his legs are covered, in large part because the braces are exposed. You don't want to see those braces. Okay? 
Um, the two men do not dislike each other. Um, Cooler, uh, Hoover is not a gregarious person in, in and of himself, um, but uh, Roosevelt clearly felt as if he had been kind of sidelined by Hoover after the election. Hoover loses in a historic landslide. Um, Hoover's friend once telegraphed him and said, vote for Roosevelt to make it unanimous. Ouch, that has to hurt, right? You know, oh, really? Um, he wins a devastated economic situation and is sitting there. He wins, the American people want to pivot. This is the first Tuesday in November. And then from November to December to January to February to March, we've now corrected that. Those long months are the worst for bank failures. And this guy on the left is going, I'm no longer the elected president. I don't want to be setting policy. And this guy on the right is that I'm not the constitutional president. I don't know. I can't make decisions. I'm not, uh, not inaugurated. And in essence, what you see is the banking crisis begin to just greater in the United States. Remember that slide I showed? 4,000 banks are collapsing in 1932 and 1933. When Roosevelt takes office, um, you can see him right here with, with his top hat. So he's walking, his two sons are on either side of him. The very first thing Roosevelt says, and he'll kick over here in a second uh, in terms of the audio, the very first thing he says is dealing with this psyche of the American public at this point in time. So this is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is Fear itself. He's looking at Americans, right? Next time you hear the Star Spangled Banner, home of the free, land of the brave, or land of the brave, home of the free, whatever it is, right? Is that we pride ourselves on this notion of saying, and he says it, we've had tough times before. We had a civil war, we had a revolution, we've had economic depressions, we've had people hating each other because of politics, and we've made it through it. What's different is that if you have a political culture, if you have a, polit a politician, who is going to accentuate that fear, right? That big book I brought in, boom, freedom from fear. The argument he's making is that inherently, America works without this idea of being fearful all the time. A critical race theory of you know, people, you know, rapists and murderers coming across the border. It's very easy, as we're gonna see from a politician's standpoint, to use that to generate people's emotions up. Roosevelt, on the first thing he says to the American people, I ain't going there. It's not who we are, that sure as hell isn't how we're getting out of this problem. Is there something to fear? Yeah, you could lose your business, your farm, your livelihood. There is something to fear. The first thing he does upon achieving presidency is shut down the banking system. As he calls it a banker's holiday. Bankers only work from nine to 10 anyway, so we'll just send them all out fishing. That's the federal government shutting down the bank. You cannot get access to your ATM or anything like that. Holy shit, that is a significant use of federal authority. So Roosevelt is saying these bankers need to get their act together and figure out what kind of help is required. Otherwise, the system is just gonna continue to slide over the edge of the hill, all right? So Roosevelt's style, his approach, is tapping into what is inherently part of the American historical experience, and that's optimism, that's hope, not lottery ticket hope. Hope that leave me the hell alone and I'll figure it out myself. I know what's best for me. So it's both conservative and liberal. What it isn't, and again, 2022, it's like speaking to a weird, you know, it's like, the dessert. it's not playing on fear. It's not playing on, oh, you've gotta be afraid of this and afraid of that and afraid of this, right? And that's what enters into the political dialogue quite, quite simply. What is gonna be produced is something that's referred to as the New Deal. Why is it called the New Deal? Because Teddy started with all the new stuff. Right. So Teddy had a, what is it, or a square deal, he did all the deals. So Teddy's got a square deal, Franklin's had a new deal, Truman has a, I forgot what kind of deal. Um, you know, it just becomes part of the political, political lifestyle. I mean, that's not. What it is, is making a transition, as you can see, from a, a basically a corporate welfare state, 
if you work for Ford Motor Company, Ford Motor Company is going to provide you retirement. Ford Motor Company is going to provide health care. Ford Motor Company is going to provide a, a minimum wage. When that disappears, you still have the population looking around going, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm still showing up at work. How come I'm getting half my paycheck? Oh, well, Ford Motor Company doesn't want to go out of business. That's legitimate. Well, wait a minute. There is an unwritten agreement that we are willing to do this Charlie Chaplin work because that's the nature of the economy. If that isn't the nature of the economy, then let me know. Right? What it does, in essence, is say, very much like national progressivism, very much like the radical Republicans in Reconstruction, the federal government has the power to do this. It's written into the Constitution. And just ex exercising that power becomes uh, a component. As I'll come back to, it is a clear and outright rejection of social Darwinism. You are not better because you're rich. You're not smarter because you're rich. You're not, you're richer because you're rich. Right? And that carries in itself its own advantage. This idea that somehow because you're wealthy, you have an exalted status in American society runs counter to the very nature of what, um, again, America stands for. Um, the basic policy is three things that this new federal government is willing to do. Limit unemployment and spur economic growth. How are they going to do that? By turning on and off the faucet of, of printing money. Right? Make it easier to borrow, make it harder to borrow. Make it easier to spend money, make it harder to spend money. To assist citizens who have been harmed by no fault of their own. Right? At a certain point in time, I'm going to be too old to do certain jobs. I already can't dance, number one, but certainly not able to. I've been working my entire life. I've been working since I've been 12 years old, literally, right? back in the day. Right? I, I, only because of my age, I would not be able to do certain jobs. In essence, the same thing is true. Disability, age, unemployment, right? Your arm ripped off because you work in a steel industry. You have done, the argument is, is that you don't lose everything as an American in the wealthiest country on the planet simply because you have bad luck and the person next to you doesn't. Again, when we get to the contemporary period of time, right? Corpus Christi roads suck. Everybody knows that, right? How do you fix those? Well, everybody pays five dollars, and every you know goes into a tax base, and you, you, you fix the roads. We're not willing to do that, right? What we say is that somebody in here is going to lose an axle, somebody in here is going to lose a muffler, somebody in here is going to have their tires flattened as a result of potholes. If you ever drive on my street. Right? Somebody individually is going to pay for what collectively could be prevented. That's what's at the core here of saying there is a common nature of everybody drives their car, so why don't we fix the goddamn roads? Right? Uh, lastly, government is to protect the rights of property from larceny. Meaning what? Meaning if you have property, government, or I should say businesses, can't simply cook the books and say, you know, why is Trump under indictment in the state of New York? Because it is argued he cooked the books. He said, in essence, this is not how much money I have, and give me loans based on that. If you're loaning money out to someone, they are going to look into your financial background and see whether or not you are worth that loan. If you lie about it, the person loaning money to you has been cheated. They cannot effectively assess that risk. Right? So again, if you're conservative, you're looking and saying, yeah, that's pretty damn important. Um, if you're a liberal, you're looking maybe at this idea of saying, hey, listen, somebody's harmed by no fault of their own. So this is not, again, it's, I'm not going to keep going with the TV and radio and whatever. The contemporary assessment of the New Deal is socialism, and it's a joke. It's, it's a lack of understanding of both terms. Right? What it doesn't do is hard to identify. It's really easy to identify what it, does, what it does not do. It doesn't end the Great Depression. World War II is going to end the Great Depression. In essence, then what it, why is it important? Because it is giving Americans a sense of hope. Somebody somewhere cares about the fact that I'm about to lose my farm. Somebody somewhere in Washington, D.C. cares about the fact that I've got my retirement invested in a bank that seems to be going belly up. It doesn't change federal intervention. We've been talking about this since the first lecture of class. Radical republicanism, populism, progressivism, all of them are arguing the exact same thing, and that is the federal government exists as the Constitution exists. They're one and the same thing. It's active for a total of five years. Oh my God, yeah, the New Deal goes on and on. It doesn't, and as I pointed out later on, it, it, it doesn't undermine industrial capitalism, it saves it. 
every capitalist, one of them, should have a dime, have a little Roosevelt dime sitting up somewhere and saying, that's the guy who, when the economy tanks globally, is able to protect industrial capitalism in the United States of America. It doesn't happen in Russia, it doesn't happen in Germany, it doesn't happen in Italy or, or, or Japan. And unless you look at those people and say, oh, well, they're losers, they're whatever. They're under the same pressures as industrial capitalist nations, and they don't decide to save industrial capitalism, but they do something completely different. Um, and the New Deal certainly doesn't leap ahead of the American public. The American public is pushing for much more radical uh, uh, policies. Uh, as we're going to see. Roosevelt is going to play that politically. He knows the American public is not interested in getting rid of industrial capitalism. He knows the American public is inherently, we're reformers, we're not radicals. And so he keeps his political kind of machinations going down the middle of the road. We're not going to see that in Germany. What we're going to see in Germany is people who are going to say, be fearful, be afraid. It's Jews, it's, it's you know, it's others, it's outsiders. You're scared, you're terrified, it's racial, right? Roosevelt avoids that kind of childish political activity um, by and large, right? Key points to consider here is that the New Deal focuses on economic issues, work and competition. If you're looking for the 60s, if you're looking for, you know, civil rights legislation for women or people of color or recent immigrants, it ain't the New Deal. Uh, this is not a period of time. We will get to the modern civil rights movement in the, after World War II and why it's after World War II. Right? And why Hector P. Garcia standing on our campus is wearing a military uniform. Those are linked. Those are very closely connected. Right? It's not until the 50s and 60s that the federal government really gives a damn about people of color, women, immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Poverty. This is not about poverty. This is about stabilizing industrial capital. So again, what radio told me, whatever, you know, take whatever you want. You want to be spoon-fed whatever information and, and, and open your mouth another spoonful will be right there tomorrow, right? Okay, the New Deal unfolds in two legislative periods. They're called 100 days, it's about three months. And the argument is this, there's an election, in comes a new group of congressmen. These congressmen are all excited because they've been, you know, campaigning. And they're going to very quickly kind of put legislation uh, in front of the, the president to sign. And it kind of works that way in terms of incentive. You look at the Biden administration. Trump is weird because there isn't any legislation, right? Obama, et cetera, uh, George W. Bush, is that you do see this, this kind of impetus early on. I'm in Washington, I'm going to pass legislation. What are the first things that Roosevelt focuses on? Not one of them is going to be a surprise to you because all of them we've been talking about since industrialization started. The first, just like Herbert Hoover, is to focus on the farm population. Roosevelt is saying 40, 45% of our population has been in poverty for 15 to 20 years. That's got to stop. And so he proposes the AAA, and don't get lost in all these. I usually don't ask questions about the, the, the alphabet soup stuff. Hey, AAA, farm bill. Right? That's the first thing Herbert Hoover does. Farm bill. How new is the New Deal? It ain't new in terms of going same priorities that the previous Republican did. The idea behind it is to try and stabilize, very much like the populists wanted to do, stabilize the fact that these people are producing a crop that then is available in a short period of time. How do you make sure that they get advantage for that when it's in high demand? You create cooperatives create the opportunity for these people to, in essence, provide this material and get credit for it for when the market is going to be more susceptible. Rating point three billion, again, the details here are, are instrumental. What, um, not important, but issue 1302, um, what, is the, what is this message sending to the rest of the world? Here you got this rich guy from New York. The first thing he spends his political capital on are these farmers, right? And guess what? Radical, uh, uh, Rural unrest drops to zero. Somebody in Washington is at least aware that I'm working my ass off growing sorghum and I'm losing my, my, my farm as a result of this. Second thing, NIRA, again, if you're into all these acronyms, go for it. Don't feel you're going to be held responsible for them on the exam. Industry, and looking and saying, we recognize that industry has changed. Roosevelt doesn't sit down with a bunch of pointy head academics and say, okay, well, how are we gonna change the, 
He brings Ford Motor Company and U.S. Steel and all these manufacturers to Washington, D.C. And he says, in essence, you've succeeded in the marketplace. How have you done so? Well, we've made sure to build a better product. We've made sure to treat our customers and our, com our more importantly, our workers well. They're the ones who are going to set these rules and wage uh, uh, guidelines. If you're somebody who's a skilled worker, you should be paid like a skilled worker. Ford Motor Company's gonna pay them that way. And if you look and see that, you know, textiles, coal, oil, retail, they're all way ahead of this game. They're already doing it. What Roosevelt kind of builds into this at the top there is that companies have an obligation to at least talk to, speak to, have some sort of communication with their workers. Doesn't have to be a union, doesn't have to be an outside source, but there needs to be some dialogue going on between capital and labor. Again, all they're doing is writing a series of codes. These codes are gonna go before the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says you don't have the authority to do that, so it's again, gonna be unconstitutional. There are, in the first two years of the, of the uh, um, NIRA, there's gonna be over 4,000 complaints leveled by workers. Three of them, three out of 4,000 are going to be, uh, um, uh, um, are going to be successful. Right? This is not a pro-worker piece of legislation. This is saying if you want to work in the American economy, you've got to have some basic assumptions about how you're going to be treating your workers. You can't just be grinding in the dust, as we saw at the end of the day. Right? Number one, farming. How surprising is that? I don't know. Uh, number two, I knew it was a new deal. Industry, basically saying we're going to have the leading in economic companies come together and say this is how we should be aid. This is how we should compete. Above board, you know, let the winner be the best product, the more successful management, etc. And the third, how new is the New Deal? It's picks up Hoover's policy. Hoover, a Republican, is the one who first had the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And as I mentioned, Hoover basically gives two trillion billion dollars to these banks, and they sit on it, and they're unwilling to spend it. How does Roosevelt change that? Roosevelt says, we're gonna continue and accentuate, the, we know there's a banking crisis, we're gonna provide liquidity to these banks, but they have to shut it down into the American economy. You can't sit on it. You can't just make Citibank wealthier. You've got to push it down to other institutions that are below. Texas alone, as you can read here, is gonna get over 4,000, nearly 4,000 payments as a result of that. Where is that money going to? It's going to average people, it's going to businesses, it's going to farmers, it's going to people who actually need it. That's the extent, now there's a whole bunch of little alphabet soup all within there, but the core of the, of the, the first 100 days is as basic as, you know, uh, it's just basic macroeconomics, right? Try and help farmers to compete on the open marketplace because of their efficiencies. Don't let them work themselves out of a job, right? Try and get companies to play by a set of accepted rules that are gonna accentuate competition, not undermine it. And make sure that the banking system is not simply there to protect those who are too big to fail. Force the money down into people's hands. That's it, right? That's the radicalness of the New Deal. That is using the federal government to say, here's how we're going to respond. What it does is almost immediately stop the banking crisis in the lower world. Again, you know, a single year of 500 is a bad year. This is over six years, less than 500 are going to fail. Now you could also argue if you're a bit of a cynic, say, well, most of the, most of the weak ones are dead anyway, right? You know, they're no long gone. You can't lose the, all the banks we had. Um, how new is the New Deal? This, it's, it, this is stuff that we've been talking about since industrialization. It's not new, it's not radical. There are going to be things we're gonna see in the second 100 days that are gonna be different. The change that takes place, very much like radical Republicans and Thaddeus Stevens, and Teddy Roosevelt is a progressive, is a willingness to act. And if it fails, two of those bills I just talked about are gonna be deemed unconstitutional. If it fails, you admit it, and you move on and you try something else. But the American public are going to see a politician who is willing to do this to try and fix the condition in which they find themselves in. Right? Try something. The Americans reward them. We like lead follow get out of the way. We like people who are in a position to lead to lead. Right? And take all the political heat that kind of comes with them. The economy responds, but it doesn't respond fast enough. So if you're looking at the economic indicators, they would begin to 
recover. You would start to see a recovery, but it's not going to be a sudden spike. If you're in Germany, what's going to happen? The state is going to take control of our industry. That's socialism, right? The state's going to own the manufacturing of automobiles, and you know what they're going to do? Their economy is going to skyrocket. And if you're in the United States, you look and say, well, hey, look at this fascist guy. He seemed to have all the answers. Roosevelt is saying, the responsibility of the federal government is not to step in and do all this. What we're there to do is to make sure it's stable, make sure that people are able to work within them. What you see is a series of radicals on either side, both on the left and on the right. Fascism on the right. We need an authoritarian. We need a, we need a dictator, not a dictator. We need a leader. We need one person who represents and is going to make tough decisions. And who cares if there are laws that prevent that? Or we need communism. Right? The Soviet Union is now a reality. Our neighbor, Mexico, is in still in the throes of kind of what happened with their, <clears throat> their revolution in 1911. You know, labor radicals, old social Darwinists, etc., they're all floating around out there. The ones that tend to lead and get the greatest press during this period of time, not, not coincidentally, are those who have access to mass media. Again, they have a TV show, they have, not TV, but they have a radio show, they have access. Father Coughlin, this guy down here screaming and hollering, right? Um, you know, we, we're familiar with this kind of political style, right? Sits there and calls people communists and radicals and Jews and all this kind of stuff. He is in large part going to advance that kind of notion of, of fascist, find a way in which to blame someone else. The reason you're suffering is because of the person sitting next to you. And you should hate them, right? And you should find a way in which their un-Americanness is going to be somehow found illegal. Uh, Dr. Townsend, a thin faced guy right here, is going to look at unemployment in the elderly and in essence suggest a redistribution of wealth. You guys go to work and pay old folks like me to not work. That's not the system we have right now, right? Um, and the one that is kind of up in Sinclair I've talked about before. He's a straight up socialist. He's basically saying we need to nationalize these, these we need to nationalize the steel industry, we need to nationalize the, the farm, you know, the large farm, uh, uh, private farms that are out there. We need to become more like the Soviet Union or more like a socialist country. Okay. The one that's probably the most dangerous is this guy, Huey Long. I always call him Howie Long, not the football player, Huey Long. He's a senator from the state of Louisiana. Remember that Louisiana is part of the Reconstruction South, and so for the most part, what you have um, is a political waste field. Democrats are important as part of the Democrat. Democrats from the South are important as part of the Democratic coalition, but it's been Republicans leading the country for the last 35 years, right? Um, Long is going to make an argument as a Democrat that Roosevelt is not going far enough. He's gonna create something called Share Our Wealth uh, organizations. And you can read this, okay? A 100% tax on the wealthy over a million dollars. A 100% tax on inheritance. Um, a guaranteed income. Uh, money for everyone. Every man a king is his argument. And the unsustainability of this is really not the point. What Long is doing is kind of building on this populist surge of the 1890s and 1900, early 1900s of saying, in essence, that what we need to do is redistribute wealth. Okay? He is someone who is on the field of the Democratic primary. He looks and says, politically, in 1940, Roosevelt, or excuse me, 1932, Roosevelt is not going to cure the Great Depression. And in 36, as a Democrat, he is going to lose probably to Herbert Hoover. Uh, he's positioning himself to be the Democratic nominee in 1940. Right? So he's a politician who's trying to harm a, a rival politician. And Roosevelt recognizes this, right? Uh, one of the two most dangerous men in America. The other one, by the way, you have a J. Edgar Hoover. Right? Hoover's getting files on everybody and you know, all kinds of, un, you know, they're all, all <coughs> sexual practices and you have a mistress and you, have, you know, didn't, didn't, you know, didn't pay your taxes in 1912 or something like that. Long's populism, and I won't, I won't play, Huey's an idiot, I, I should play, but, but it's, it's, it's an indication in essence that in the United States, we are not immune to fascism. Again, not a surprise in 2020. We are not immune to authoritarianism. One person stepping forward and saying, I have all the answers. If you go back to that first thing that Roosevelt said, the first thing he said when he was president of the United States, you as a country have gone through these problems and have worked your way through them. It is difficult. Democracy is a difficult thing to do. But what Long says and what politicians, 
Don't worry about any of that. Don't think. Don't think for yourself. I can do it for you. As long as you listen to me, and as long as you only listen to me, right? I'm going to do this. That is the American tradition. Right? The other notion of saying, well, I'm just going to put one, one person in charge is not in America. We have consistently been some, a country that has rejected that. All of that has been put on hold. All of that as a historical conclusion has been put on hold. Because we're, we're, we're seeing it. Right? Let's see what happens over the next few uh, years. Long is not going to be a problem because he is going to be assassinated, um, at least a problem politically. Uh, in 1935, I believe, um, this doctor, the Louisiana doctor, it's a local political uh, gripe. Um, one of the things Long does is destroy the, 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 the family of uh, Carl Weiss, and Carl Weiss is Jewish, right? So he's using his Judaism, he claims that he's miscegenated, so there's black blood in his background, and in Louisiana, that was going to be enough to piss him off. Um, you can Google this and find there's a whole conspiracy. So Weiss is gonna show up with a 22 caliber pistol and get one shot off, right, one shot. And they dig a bullet out of Huey. But he is gonna die because he has got bullet fragments in his body that they did not find, one of which cuts an artery in his liver. Liver is where your blood purifies, so he bleeds out. He dies as a result of those, those fragments. Where did the other shots come from? Well, in all likelihood, it was his bodyguards, and they had, had a name for themselves, so I won't quote here, um, who were around him all the time, shot 60 bullets, 60, right? I mean, just think about the noise and the, you know, whatever, 60 bullets in terms of, the, in all likelihood, his own bodyguards led to his own death. Um, there's all kinds of questions about, you know, not, not, not the grassy knoll, but Americans love this stuff. And I will play this clip. So this little old lady from Louisiana, she's talking about her family when they heard the news. Um, so she's a Louisiana native, and so she's just, you know, adorable sweet. And then another is uh, Izzy Stone, who's a, who's a journalist. Both of them conclude the same thing. So. He hadn't died when I heard it. We, I was listening to the Governor, radio Senator. and heard it on Walter Winchell. And I ran down the steps to the office as fast as I could go to see where Hotting was, because it said it was a man in white. And thank God Hotting was there. And my mother telephoned from New Orleans and said, Betty, where is Hotting? I said, Hotting's here, hang up, I've got to find Mr. Carter, his father. Find her husband, because she thought they shot him. And everybody in the state felt that way, that uh, everyone, all the antis, you didn't know who it was. It could have been anybody. And I hate to say we really hoped that he would die. Uh, now, that's a terrible thing really? to say. I was very impressed with him. It's a, but it's a terrible thing to say. I was really glad when they shot him. I don't believe in terrorism or assassination, but he could have become an American dictator. Hold that thought. Because unless you think Germans are automatically fascist, unless you think Italians are, unless you think Japanese are, the reason they choose that is because they're pissed off and their politicians said, you're pissed off and we're gonna make sure and, and, and solve that problem by taking it out on somebody else. Fascism is not inoculated from any country. Authoritarianism. And that's exactly what Huey Long represented. Right? Long is assassinated and taken out of the picture. That's what both of those people are, are, are referring to. Roosevelt takes the opportunity. The economy isn't moving fast enough. He's a politician. Right? Again, your heroes should not be politicians. That'd be my strong suggestion. Right? He's recognizing that he's getting pressure on the far right and the far left, which means what? The middle is wide open. In the 1990s, they're going to refer to this as triangulation, fancy name, but a pretty simple concept. You've got a whole bunch of people over here and a whole bunch of people over here. The key is this notion is that Americans generally aren't radicals. We don't want a dictator. We don't want somebody to come in and tell us what to do. Right? We don't historically like to have our own personal freedom. The idea of one person telling what to do with your body, for example, wearing masks and whatever, um, kind of sits poorly with us. Right? And in a sense, this political stasis creates an opportunity for Roosevelt to act. Here's where you see Roosevelt with a much more radical, and again, even today, by today's standards, it's not even radical. By World War II standards, it's not even radical. Again, three pieces of legislation uh, 100 days after the 1934 elections. Right, so they win in 1932, boom, you see this sort of reaction. They win again, Democrats win more seats in 1934, boom, a second 100 days. One of them is deficit spending. And the idea is saying the United States has the wherewithal. Ford Motor Company doesn't. 
U.S. Steel doesn't, the city of Corpus Christi doesn't, has the wherewithal to spend money that it cannot account for yet. Right? We don't know where this is coming from. Right? That means you run a deficit. The argument is it's the same thing with a credit card. You're spending money now that you don't own because you have confidence that you're going to be able to pay it back in the future. And there's a cost to borrowing that. There's, a, there's interest rates. What are they going to focus on? They're going to focus on projects that the private sector refuses to do. There are not companies building dams in the South. There are not companies that are building, you know, aqua, you know the, the, the uh, uh, viaducts and railroad crossings and what have you. These are self-liquidating projects. Today we've kind of heard of shovel-ready projects. These are things that the private sector isn't going to do, but in a sense, it is useful to everyone in American society. Most of our bridges around in South Texas are built in the 1930s. Enjoy that next time you're driving over them, right? This is 100 years old. Um, you know, it's, it, infrastructure is kind of an important part. I've mentioned TVA, it refers to Tennessee Valley Authority. It is straight up socialism, right? It is saying an entire subset of the American population, the old Confederacy, the South, is so far behind, there is no way in hell the private economy is going to bring electricity to these people. Why would you? Right? It's like putting it on the moon. Why would you invest in some place that has no promise of development? Roosevelt's argument is that we owe it to them as Americans. We pay for that, we as the United States. We begin to rural, do rural electrification, and we're going to see in World War II, particularly for a state like Texas, all of this federal money coming in, building roads, building infrastructure, putting up water treatment plants. Right? That's socialism. And you're the benefits of it, and so am I, right? But there's no market reason for doing this, and there certainly isn't any other uh, connection to that. I'll come back to this. The, the project was to spend $11 billion over eight years, which was a mind gobsmacking number at the time. This is not even a drop in the bucket of what the United States is gonna spend in World War II, right? So World War II is gonna turn that fire hose on, and it's going to, in essence, pump money back into the American economy. Roosevelt is playing around with it, and he's kind of, kind of getting to that, that point. Right? Number two, Social Security. Right? Probably the greatest legacy of the New Deal. Is Social Security a giveaway? It's kind of a trick question, if you're really or historically. Right? No. When you work, you pay into a tax. It is an insurance tax. If you have car insurance and you get into a fender vendor, you don't have to ask your insurance company to pay for it. Your, co your insurance company is contractually applied to pay for it. That's what Social Security is. It is a guaranteed income once you are no longer allowed, able to work, to say, I have been working, and I'm going to have a minimum payment, a minimum payment, so I'm not eating cat food and whatnot. It changes in terms of the amount of money. If you make a lot of money in your life, you're gonna have a higher Social Security payment. If you make not much money, there is at least a cutoff at the bottom that says, I forget what it is, $200, $230 a month. You know, good luck paying for your phone bill on that, and much less uh, uh, any other basic amenities. Uh, Roosevelt, we put the payroll contributions there to give contributors the legal, moral, and political right to collect their pensions and their unemployment benefits without tax. Without those taxes, there are no damn politician if he's one of them. Will ever spend my social security? Right. So the average payment is, is not a, a statement of the lows. That is not high living, I promise you that. Um, that is not something making $16,000 a year is not something you're going to really um, be able to afford that cattle. Okay. The last one, and I'll finish here, is going to be the National Labor Relations Act. Roosevelt gets credit for this. It's really the guy with the eyebrows down there, John Lewis, who is a labor leader. He is the leader of the uh, um, CIO, uh, Industrial Union. It is going to, in essence, begin the process of forcing, forcing federal negotiations if there's an impasse over labor and capital. National Labor Relations Board. So it hasn't happened yet, but Major League Baseball cannot get a new working agreement. At some point in time, either the owners or the Major League Players Association are going to say, let's go to arbitration. That's where this comes from. In essence, it decriminalizes the right of unions to exist. And once that happens, union membership skyrockets. Right, in the United States. Right. I won't get to the conclusions, obviously, they're in the PowerPoint, I won't have you. Um, let me know between now and Friday morning.